great cruise. Yes. yes, I love this cruise. I'm so happy that each and every single one of you are joining us here for this love boat theme cruise. But folks, I'm not gonna do a whole bunch of talking because I know who Woo. you all are here to see. <laughs> Are you all ready for the cast of the Love Boat? Well, let's welcome them to the stage, starting off with our cruise director. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Cynthia Lauren Tweed. Your bartender, please welcome Tim Lang. Next is your purser, please welcome Fred Grandy. Your doctor is Bernie Gumbang! And last but certainly not least, Vicky Steubing and our Princess Cruises Celebration Ambassador, it's Jill Whelan! for joining us, thank you so much. Thank you for coming on this cruise and enjoying. Look at all these people, they love you. Now, we love you back. <laughs> now, I, I, I don't want to start without giving a bit of credit where credit is due. The amazing Gavin McLeod. our global ambassador for, for more than 35 years, a captain steward, a great man, an incredible human being. Uh, you all have said so many great things about him. He's had an incredible career as well. And I want to show you a little video of some of the amazing things that Gavin McLeod has accomplished throughout his life. Let's take a look. <clears throat> Love exciting and new. This is your captain speaking, Captain Steubing, that is. Many of you have sailed with us before, and you can see none of us actors are getting older. But you are. It's so wonderful from the love book, getting back together, putting on uniforms, getting to call each other our characters' names. I'm so grateful because I think that show, besides what it did for cruising, we all know what, 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 what it did for cruising. Happy 50th anniversary, Princess Cruises! The joy of, of cruising, of being on a princess ship that exists in our beings. This show has been the greatest gift. You know, all those critics laughed at us and we're not going to last more than two weeks. Well, when we became Goodwill Ambassadors for the United States, I think they ate their words. It's a great honor to be on this ship, to be standing on this ship, being with these people. Every one of these old people's got a life story and each one could write a book. You know, after so many years, you grow into the character more and more, and so that's sort of what's happened. And the captain is not far from me. Once I put on the hat, I become him, because it's very easy, because he is me. Okay, gentlemen, let's check our positions. I know what I'm proud of Princess Cruise, it's come so far since we first set foot on that ship and our pilot. It's a blessing to be able to share our lives with each other this way. We named this ship Regal Princess, may God bless her and all who sail in her. Set a course for adventure, your mind on the deep romance. 
what it did for all of our lives, everything we've been through, and now here we're sitting in front of you in these costumes, it's our uniforms. <laughs> we take these things off and we're just a slubby guy walking, an old man walking down with a cane almost. You know, I'm perfect on this ship. Love. I never dreamt that it would evolve into representing the Prunes line, being all these years later, bringing joy to people, changing people's lives, you know, and we just did it as actors, thinking, boy, this is going to be nice, and look at the result. I adore these people. These people, we've grown to be adults together. We were kind of young when we started that show, and now we're adults, and we've gone through things with our families, with ourselves. I mean, I've reached death's door four or five times in my life and it's such a, a great moment to be able to stand here and still represent Princess Cruises. I have so much to thank God for and Princess Cruises for. They, they both keep me afloat. I mean, Gavin, he, he showed us that cruising, not just the television show, but cruising in general, gives the world something to believe in. And he is an incredible, incredible thought, incredible, he just, he's, he, yeah. <laughs> uh, so a after, uh, you all have shared great words about Gavin, and I kind of want to share some of the words that you all said uh, that they might not have known that you said about Gavin. Uh, now, Lauren, uh, you said about Gavin, uh, he was a gem in a world of rocks. I'm so grateful for his positivity, <laughs> faith, and the just he, the, I hope that he finds the surety of heaven for sure. Aww. He's incredible. He's such a positive person. And how did he inspire you when you first started the show? I would just say that, that I'm not sure that he did inspire me when I first started, but knowing Gavin for 45 years was a real pleasure and a gift from him. Um, he helped bring me back to God. He Aww. kept, he had the most positive energy. <laughs> and that was good. So, I mean, he just taught us all how to, if you just keep being positive, positive will happen. That's good. <laughs> Bernie, Bernie, you said Gabby was one of my... <laughs> <laughs> my, my mentor Fred keeping me awake <laughs> so you said that Gavin was one of my dearest friends we met and bonded in 1963 uh, which uh, he was break on a show that he was regularly on we spoke often uh, those last few years reminiscing about the many happy times we spent together and the familial bond that our whole cast shares and he was my loving brother and I will miss him terribly. <laughs> now you've had uh, one of the longest relationships with Gavin out of the group and I'm sure you can still hear him talking to you. If you could call him one last time, what do you think you'd chat to him about? Say it again? If you could talk to him about <laughs> If you could have one more, one more call, one more talk, what, what do you think you guys would chat about? Well, more than a chat, we would hug, we hugged a lot, and the first day uh, in the dressing room, <clears throat> Gavin and I got together, he sat down, had a free cup of coffee, and said, Burn, we got a job! <laughs> and the job continued and continued and continued, and uh, we shared so many happy memories all over the world. And uh, the first couple of years, it was Mexico, 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 Mexico. <laughs> and then somebody whispered in Aaron Spelling's ear, Aaron, guess what? We're a hit. We can go other places as well. <laughs> so we went to the Caribbean, then we went to the Mediterranean. We went to Scandinavia. We went to the Near East, the Far East. We went over the world, and as a result, we can get a good seat in any restaurant <laughs> all over the world. <laughs> 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 
But there was there was a a tradition in um, in our business, and it was an awful tradition for the director to perceive which of the actors and actresses were the weakest. And they would pick on that person to assert their authority, hmm. not a wonderful creative idea. So Gavin came to me one day, and there was a director who was behaving in just that way. And Gavin said, Bern, let's have a little chat with this guy. <laughs> His name will remain anonymous. <laughs> What was it again? <laughs> Jack Arnold. <laughs> who I'm sure we all remember with great affection. Uh, <laughs> so, so Gavin, uh, Gavin said, uh, Jack, let's uh, step into my office. Not to embarrass him too much. And Jack uh, stepped over to where Gavin was and where I was. And he said, uh, Jack, a little chat with you if you don't mind. Please understand this. There's no animosity here, it's just a little suggestion. You may not behave that way on our set. <laughs> and I chimed in and I said, uh, is that clear? <laughs> and Jack said, okay, 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 okay. But we shared so, every, every time I had a scene with, with Gavin, I said, I'm so grateful, I'm so grateful. He made your life so, he was so generous uh, with his time, with his, he made sure you were facing the camera. He was, what was that, Sonny? <laughs> And uh, it was years, and, and when the show was on television for years afterwards, he would call me and I would call him and say, this is what we looked like 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but the dearest, dearest, uh, most generous human being, I love him dearly, Gabby up in the sky, I love you, my dear friend. May flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Now, Fred, Fred, you know, you said uh, his joy was infectious and you could not come away from him without feeling better about yourself and the world we live in. He was one of the best. Now that means so much, especially in the world that we live in now. Can you tell us a time where Gavin made you feel better about yourself for a certain situation? Well, first of all, Gavin was the perfect avatar for this show because Gavin made you feel good about yourself and the show made you feel good about yourself. And there are no shows that do that anymore. Aren't I correct about that? Yeah. 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 Give it up for The Walking Dead. Anyway. Um, but, but Gavin was that rare human being, and, and this is interesting, you know, when the show was first going through its iterations, we had to make three pilots to get it right. Uh, Ted and Bernie and I were in the second one, that wasn't enough, so then they had to bring in Cindy and, and finally Gavin. And even after the third show, there was only really, there were only really two people that believed the show would be a hit. One was Gavin and the other, happily, was Aaron Spelling. <laughs> and he was absolutely right. And the, the thing that I reflect on now is what made Gavin so extraordinary was how ordinary he was. He had had a huge hit with the Mary Tyler Moore show, although he had kind of been the run of the litter, if you remember. He was the one guy who didn't win an Emmy Award. And yet, he went right from that into the love boat, said this is going to be a big hit. It became a big hit. But he never became so big that he was not part of our ensemble. He was first among equals. Everybody understood that. But he never played that card. He was always eminently accessible to all of us on all matters. And that is why when I decided I was going to change my life and go back to Iowa and run for Congress, <coughs> I had, oh 
sure. Now you tell me. Where were you when I was running out of money? But the, the point is, I, I had shared this with a, a number of, couple of people I knew in the business, and they all thought it was a terrible idea. What are you going, getting into politics? And then I took it to Gavin, and he said, you have to do this. You absolutely have to do this. And he came out, and he campaigned for me. Wow. And then <clears throat> I, I won a very, very close race. It was a nail-biter all the way through the night. Declared me about midnight. Next morning, I'm in Iowa, right? I get a phone call at 8 o'clock in the morning. It's Gavin calling from California. We're at 6 o'clock in the morning. I said, you won! I said, yeah. <laughs> and we talked for a while, and then he said something that I have remembered every day for the rest of my life. He said, well, you're the captain now. <laughs> I took that as his final command to me. Go out, be the captain in your life. Get it done. So, did he affect my life? Nah, no, forget about it. Uh, but he was, he was a profound influence without even trying. And, and when you think about it, yes, he was the captain. Yes, he was an authority figure. But it was his gentleness of spirit that we all recall. And that I think... You know, we shouldn't mourn Gavin because he's right where he wants to be right now, but we should all miss him. Well, Jill. <laughs> you were Gavin's on-screen daughter, but in real life, he treated you like a daughter. Can you tell me a little bit more about you and Gavin's relationship? Oh, Gavin, first of all, we were eating buddies. <laughs> Gavin and I were always on a diet together. Um, we would be sitting in our trailers waiting to do a scene, and we, we got this idea there was a newfangled thing that if anybody has pain, you know now it's called a TENS machine and you, you get electrical, but back then, it was an, a, a way to exercise without exercising. <laughs> So Gavin and I would sit in his trailer with a plate full of french fries and a sheet on it. Um, yeah. Uh, so so he, we were partners in crime even though he was a, a dad figure. I remember we were in Amsterdam and I had had my first boyfriend in real life. And he was on a school trip and I think we had broken up or something. And, but he came and I didn't want to see him and he, they called from downstairs in the lobby of our hotel and Gavin was in the room with me. And he panicked as much as, as I panicked. Where, where did he go? Where did he go? He went and hid behind the curtains with his feet sticking out. And I said, Gavin, I can see you. He runs into the bathroom. Now, you know, it's the tick-tock of time happening before the guy gets up to the room to knock on the door. He knocks on the door. Gavin runs into the, into the bathroom, flushes the toilet, and goes, Oh, thank you very much. I forgot to let me use your bathroom. I have to go now. Bye. <laughs> and left me. <laughs> but besides all that fun playfulness that he absolutely was, I mean, he had such a lust for life and everything in life from hot dogs to, to travel to people to stories. He was enthusiastic about everything and everybody and it didn't matter who you were or where you came from. He wanted to know you. And um, as a father figure for me, because I was working away from my family down in Los Angeles, he was, he was everything. He taught me how to be um, respectful on a set. He taught me what humility looks like. Um, he taught me about grace. So he was a huge influence and still is in my life. You called Gavin our fearless leader. 
He said he was a shining example of the, what the best things are about being in show business. He taught me grace and the fine art of being a host to the many guest stars that shared our screen. And there were more than a thousand guest stars on the Love Boat, uh, something that has never been repeated in any show. Thousands of guest stars. Ted, uh, share with us uh, how Gavin shaped you into the actor that you are today. Fred and I were the youngsters on the show. <laughs> Still are. <laughs> Gavin and Bernie were the older actors. So Fred and I called them the old farts. Anyway, you know, when you're when you you're an actor and you struggle and you struggle and you struggle and you finally hit something that's wonderful and is really going to change your life both uh, in recognition and financially and all of that, it gets to be a little heady. And I'm so grateful that our leader was Gavin. Because he taught us how to <laughs> how to welcome people onto the show. He said, this is our home. They're coming into our home. Greet them and let them know it's all right. And that's what we did. And a couple of times we had guest stars on that were used to fighting. So they came up onto the show ready to kind of punch and fight and Get kick and scratch. It. And they didn't have to on the love boat. Everybody wanted to do the love boat. Every, everybody that left the love boat would tell other people what a great time they had on our show. And it just wasn't cruising to a foreign country. It was how we, the cast, treated them in our house. Gavin taught us that. supported your dreams, whatever they were. He and Patty came to see, I wrote a play about George Washington and his favorite slave. It's called George Washington's Boy. And he came out to a little college in the San Fernando Valley to see the play. He and uh, his wife Patty and Bernie and uh, they all came and they saw the show and after the show, he was genuinely moved. And he said, Ted, you've, you've got to write more plays. This is, this is wonderful. Because the play not only dealt with emotion and that sort of thing, it was historical and it was entertaining and it's a craft that I learned and part of the reason for my having confidence to go on and write more plays, that was about my third or fourth play. By the way, if you haven't read one of his plays, they're available on Amazon, and I'm not joking, they really are, and they're oh, wonderful. Thank you. But, uh, I'm now up to 26 plays. Oh. Yeah. Um, and part of the reason is that is I wanted to fulfill the promise that I made to Gavin when he came to see one of my plays. Wow. Anyway, he was... He really was a leader. He knew how to lead, and he instilled in us the right thing to do when you're on a movie set, on a television set, or just walking across the stage. He was a wonderful man. So let's talk about the show. Let's talk about the reason that a lot of these people know you, love you. It's been a big part of our week. I've been watching episodes all week long. I have. None of you have changed a bit. <laughs> <laughs> exact same. Exact same. Uh, I want to know about some of the things that happened on stage, on set, uh, on the ship where you were filming, on the, in, on set. Tell me about your first 
kiss, your first on-screen kiss at Jill, because you, you started real young. Oof. Oof. I mean, it was my first kiss off stage or on stage, and I got to do it in front of an entire crew of Teamsters. <laughs> Who I loved dearly, but not necessarily wanted to kiss in front of them. Um, it was a, a <laughs> mortifying experience. Who, do you remember who it was with? Who was it, who was it with? <sighs> I can't remember if it was Glenn Scarpelli or if it was Jimmy Osmond. I think it was Glenn, but I'm not it, sure. I think it probably was Glenn. And the great part is Glenn and I are still friends today, and he's gay, so I think that's my fault. <laughs> Tells me. You're so powerful. That's right. That's funny. <laughs> so, so beyond beyond romance, you also you were doing schooling while you were you were on the ship. Were you on set? What, what was the filming like? Like growing up on a ship. Um. Well, for me, because I didn't have any other experience, that was my only childhood. For me, it was super normal. But um, it was. We would have to do a certain amount of hours of school during the day. So while everybody else was filming, I would be upstairs with my tutor. Uh, one of the great perks was that my school was nice enough to try to arrange what my studies were depending on where we were traveling. Wow. So I was taking an Asian civilization course and I was reading about the Great Wall of China while I was sitting on it. Wow. So that was pretty amazing. And the only downside is when we would be in these beautiful locations, whether it be Mexico or the Mediterranean or Australia or wherever, on a day when everybody had the day off, and it was when we had smaller ships, so we had portholes, we didn't have balconies back then, and I would just be sitting there with my tutor, in my <laughs> little miserable cabin, <laughs> looking out at the beautiful ocean, knowing everybody was upstairs by the pool, that was the only downside, but I made up for it. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Now, uh, Bernie, Bernie Capel, Doc was a ladies' man. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. Are there any uh, on-screen romance moments that stand out above the rest? What's your top on-screen romance moment? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I had had a crush on uh, Juliet Prowse uh, for, for quite a while. A stunning actress. And uh, I get this script, Doc's Exchange. And right away I call the office and I said, Who's playing Samantha? Who is playing Samantha? And I said, Wait a second. I looked it up, looked it up. Juliet Prowse. I said, Oh, how lucky can I get for it? You were cast as Julie, the cruise director. Coming from a cruise director, you are my favorite cruise director. <laughs> Not everything called Julie. I, it's because me and Julie have the same hair. <laughs> That's true. This yeah. is a wig. <laughs> Did you get it from Bernie? <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like for you for the, the audition process, the casting process? Because like I said, it happened real close to the airing and the creation of the show. I was cast the night before we started filming the pilot. Oh, wow. So I found out at nine o'clock at night that in the morning I was coming back to change my life for the next 45 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't know that at the time, but here we are. Yeah, I was cast the night before. Gotcha. So, so who was cast in the original? So there, there was like there were three pilots. So who were the who was in the first group? Who was in the second group? Who's None in the of group? us. The second pilot, you three, right? Yeah. And then the third pilot, Gavin and I. And Jill, the show didn't become complete till Jill showed up in a couple episodes. Oh. And you were supposed to, Jill, you were supposed to be just like just a just a walk on role, like a real quick one kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I was doing another show for Aaron Spelling at the time. Uh, called Friends, but not the Friends that we know. you know or I would be driving a much nicer car, but 
uh, as Aaron did with all of the people, all of the corral of actors that he had on all of his shows, whether it be Charlie's Angels or Dynasty or Hotel or whatever, they would all come through the love boat. And I was just one of the lucky ones that got to do that. And I played the part of Vicky, but not as Vicky Steubing, but just as the part of Vicky. And it was inferred that I might be the captain's daughter, uh, but I had a show to go back to. But when I went back to my show, we were canceled, and so Aaron called me at home and said, would you come back? Ted Lange. <laughs> that happened recently, too. That yes, it happened immediately. <laughs> Let's play that game. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> Those of you that missed it, I'm gonna catch them up. Do you, do you want to tell the story, Fred? You want to tell? You were there for it for the Yes No Game show. I'll tell the story. <laughs> no, 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 wait. There wait, is wait. a game called Yes No. <laughs> and Duval said, "You want to play?" And I said, "Yes." <laughs> and I walked to the hot seat. And now fully the, confident that I could, n I would not say yes or no for three minutes. Is that correct? That's, that's the game. game. Don't that's say good. yes or no for three minutes. One guy did ten seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I know I could beat that. And someone else did about a minute. So I walked and I sat down and I was really cool. <laughs> and Duval says, "Do you know how to play this game?" All right, we're going to play the game. They do a countdown, three, two, one, and you're on. And Duvall said, Ted Land. He said, yeah. <laughs> I didn't last one second. <laughs> and it will I, never be duplicated. Yeah. I want to say something about uh, Julie McCoy. Aaron Spelling was superstitious. And if you go back and you look at some of his shows, You'll find on uh, Mod Squad, the girl's name is Julie. And you'll find on the rookies, uh, Kate Jackson's character was named Julie. Oh, wow. And so everybody's trying to figure out, well, how do we make this work out? He says, I've never had a problem with a show when the female was named hmm. Julie. Oh, wow. So we're going to call character, Julie McCoy, and for whatever reason, it worked. She's the reason. Yeah. 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 Because Lauren, also, because Lauren, this, this, the entire The Love Boat television show is based on the book. It's based on a book, right? Yes, yes. written by Geraldine Saunders. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the book is called The Love Boats. And Geraldine was a cruise director in the 60s, I think. And she was an actual woman and doing the job. At, but on Cr Princess Cruises, there were no women cruise directors. I'm not sure there are now. You I think there were, are now. There are, there are some now, but yeah. you were the first. Yeah. <laughs> I was just playing it on TV, Duval. I could never do your job. <laughs> you work too hard. <laughs> I know, my dream job is to be retired. <laughs> I'm there now, I love it. <laughs> be by example, I'm following yeah, yeah. Uh, But did you have to you had to do any research to be a cruise director? I tried, well, once the show got picked up. Yes. Uh, I mean, for the pilot, no, I just made it up. But uh, for the pilot, I called Princess Cruises and asked hmm. Brian Lightfoot Carter, if you're an old princess guy, you know who I'm talking about. One of the officers from <coughs> England, he was in charge of all the cruise directors, and he was very clear that there is no possible way a woman could play, could be a cruise director. Oh, and it was lovely of me to try. <laughs> Look at you. The most that was the beginning of my time on television. <laughs> and now you're the most famous cruise director in the world. Yeah.